So I don't know how many of you are uh, HIV experts here. Nobody. Nobody. So <laughs> except well, Alessandra, I know except <laughs> Alessandra. <laughs> so then, um, then I'll give three slides of introduction, but very briefly, uh, just to remind you, because then we're going to talk about that later in detail. So it's, it's best that you know it now that uh, HIV is about 10 kb, and this is a retrovirus, so it it uh, converts the RNA genome into a double-stranded DNA and it's integrated into the genome permanently, so it sits there. And it's in its DNA form, you have uh, the uh, two long terminal repeats from which the genes are expressed. And then you have polyproteins here, um, and also accessory proteins, and these are translated into, uh, we'll concentrate a little bit on, on capsid later on, P24, uh, and also enzymes like reverse transcriptase and integrase, which is essential to integrate this uh, genome into uh, the host chromatin. And then you also you have these uh, uh, envelope proteins, uh, SU and TM, and we'll see uh, what they do later. So this is more or less the structure, is a simplified, schematized structure of how HIV looks like, and is a particle of about 100 nanometers, and you have the so-called spikes here, which are trimers of the envelope uh, glycoproteins. Uh, then you have a lipid, a lipid envelope where, that comes from the cell, that produces cells, and then you have a matrix underneath, and then a capsid, uh, which contains the uh, RNA genome, uh, and also contains uh, the various enzymes, RT, integrase, and so on and so forth. So this is the, uh, uh, a model, because we don't have the crystal structure, for, of course, of the capsid of HIV, because it's, it's, it's too large, it's too complex. However, we have a model, and the model is based on <coughs> real crystal structure of the capsid, and also now we also we have a crystal structure of the exameric capsid. So capsid form an exomer, as you can see here, uh, and this exomer is constitute a, a, a tube, and this is organized into a cone, is a full array structure, and you have exomers, and sometimes you have pentamers that are necessary to get the curvature right. Okay, so you need you need some points of uh, weakness to allow the curvature to form, and and this is the model here. And you see this little loop coming out, sticking out from the hexameric capsid. Well, this loop is in the end terminus of capsid and is centered about residues between 88 and 92, and is the loop that binds cyclophenin A. Um, we'll talk about that later again, just to, to let you know. So, again, to simplify the life cycle of this virus, as all the other retroviruses, you get the virion attaching to the cell membrane. And there is the main receptor called CD4, and then there are two main co-receptors, CCR5 and CXCR4. Uh, the virus gets in. Uh, there is some debate whether it's actually pH-dependent or independent. Um, so there are two schools now. Anyway, it, it gets in. And there is a process called uncoating that we don't really understand very well. But the capsid that I've shown you before, this one, is lost. It's probably lost progressively. Uh, and is probably lost during reverse transcription. It's possible that the RNA, uh, the RNA, you can compact RNA very easily, but once it is transformed into a double-stranded DNA, then that's much more difficult to keep it constrained to a core, because obviously the energetics to do that are much greater. So probably the core just uh, bangs up. And um, during reverse transcription, then you have a process called nuclear entry, because one of the features of HIV actually can infect uh, non-dividing cells, like, for example, macrophages uh, and resting T lymphocytes and so on and so forth. So it's, it's transported into the nucleus, is integrated, as I told you before, and this is process is driven by integrase and also cellular factors as well, like LEGDF and other factors. Uh, all the genes, this is transcribed. There is a co-activator called TAT, which will, will uh, uh, help transcription by help processivity. And then the messenger RNA transported out. Now, this is interesting because generally unspliced messenger RNA is not transported out from the cell nucleus, but HIV has tricked the cells, produced a accessory factor called REV, and REV will recruit factors to export this unspliced RNA out of the nucleus. So a very smart virus. Um, proteins are translated and then uh, uh, packaged into a new uh, viral particles. There is uh, uh, quite a number of host factors involved in the budding of HIV, and off, off it goes and starts the new cycle. Now, as you can understand here, that all viruses are parasites. We know that. So, But we know a number of cell factors that are involved in these processes. We know, for example, the main receptor. We know the co-receptor. We know that there are some, the cyclophilin is acting at this stage. We don't know exactly what it's doing, but it's acting here. 
Uh, we know that there's another host factor called ledge df which is important for the integration. We know there's the escort machinery here important for the body. But, I mean, there must be many more host factors we don't know about. So how can we understand what they are and why is this important? Well, first of all, it's important because it will teach us about host patho pathogen interactions. For example, interferon has been discovered using viruses, the flu viruses, in fact. Uh, and so we learn a lot in terms of host pathogen interaction by using viruses. Uh, we learn a lot about innate immunity. We can learn a lot about restriction factors. The second is that it, it, viruses can lead to the discovery of new cellular pathways. Oncogenes, you probably know, were discovered uh, again using retroviruses and other, other new uh, cell pathways. And also because we can develop uh, therapeutic strategies. If we know exactly what host factors are involved, we can think about blocking them or at least blocking the interaction between the host factor and the virus. And some of them are in clinical trial, and actually they are used now in the clinics, like Maraviroc, the CCR5 antagonist. Do you remember the core, one of the two major co-receptors? Uh, the, the, there are now small compounds that can block that. And also now the legitins, you know, LegDF is the integration uh, that helps. There are now molecules that are developed to block the interaction between integrase and LegDF. So that's why we want to know about them and how we go about and, uh, uh, and uh, discover them. So one strategy is to use uh, SI, uh, sRNA. So we knock them down. So there are whole genome screens you can do. You knock down all the genes you know, and then you look for what, which genes affect HIV replication. So now there is a number of these studies that have been carried out. Uh, I listed four here. The first one was by Brass. Uh, published in Science a couple of years ago, and there are now a number of others. Well, look at the problem here. I mean, this is a very powerful technique. I'm not saying it's, it's not. It's very good, of course, and we can get a lot of information, but we need to be careful about it because, for example, this screen uh, hit 293 genes important for HIV replication, 283, 303, 63. When you look at them, uh, and you try to cross-match which genes are important, actually very few seems to match. 13 here, 9 here, if you cross this and that, or this 18 between this study and that study. So, the bottom line is, it's a powerful technique, it's very important. <coughs> Many of the genes will be true, but not all of them. Uh, and also the other problem is that we may know what the genes are, but we don't know how they function, and we do not know whether they could be ever target for drug development, for example. So we, um, uh, we are attempting to use a, an alternative strategy. And this is called chemical genetics. So what is it? Well, in, in principle, it's quite simple. What you have is a number of compounds, small compounds. Uh, and remember, you know, there can be almost infinite numbers of, of small compounds. It's the chemists that make them. And then what you do, you just screen them to see which, which one of these compounds will give you a hit. So it will actually inhibit HIV replication without, of course, killing all the cells. Then you select for the compounds that are important. Uh, you can do some chemistry to modify them to try to understand better you know, which are the uh, important bits and pieces. And then you uh, try to figure out what is the target of these compounds. Okay? And then once you know the target, uh, you can try to improve and uh, understand the mechanism of action. So it's, it's an alternative to sRNA, from the, from the chemical compound to the gene to the function. So we decided to do a sort of pilot study. Uh, let's not go at the beginning with a huge library of compounds, like you know, 100,000. Let's go with very few compounds and one hypothesis, which turned out to be wrong, but never mind. Um, and we, we, we decided to see whether we could uh, use inhibitors of ATP-dependent DNA motoproteins, for example, DNA helicases, topoisomerase 1, topoisomerase 2. The reason was because we know that there are at least two steps in the HIV life cycle, and one is uh, 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 nuclear transport, and the second is integration, that most likely will need some DNA rearrangement. Um, and so we decided, well, let's test these compounds with the in action. So the protocol is uh, fairly simple. You add the compound, then you infect at time zero. 
and then you wash out the compound so that you reduce toxicity to the minimum. The, the shorter you keep it, of course, the less toxic it is. So 24 hours, and then we analyze the infected cells 24, 48, 72 hours, or again two weeks later to see whether there are long-term effects of these compounds on HIV infection. So we tested, I think, eight or nine, and uh, some of them had a little bit of activity, uh, but they were also a bit toxic. The real good one was a compound called cumarmycin A1. That had a very good IC50, uh, about one micromolar, and uh, in a replication competent virus, 0.3 micromolar. So we are in the nanomolar range, in fact, here, and uh, a decent selectivity index. So we decided, well, this is an interesting compound. Let's, let's uh, pursue this. Uh, originally, we thought that that was the mechanism of action. So then we uh, uh, characterized the structure is known. In fact, this compound is an antibiotic, has been around for a long time, developed by Roche in the 70s. And it, there is a sister compound called Novobarsin. And the, uh, the, the, there is a sort of coumarinic uh, uh, cum uh, structure here. And then there is a sugar, a Novobiose, and then, and then coumarmycin has these two uh, pyrrolic rings at the end. Um, it's important that you remember these two pyrrolic rings at the end because we'll, we'll uh, do something with them. Uh, the high molecular weight is it's not a synthetic compound, it's a natural compound, and has been tested in mice and also has been tested in humans. The problem with this antibiotic is it, that is not well absorbed by the GI tract. So, in fact, is, it, it was never licensed for the reason that it just is not absorbed. So the only way you can administer this is by IV. And by IV, it reaches quite good uh, serological concentrations. Anyway, it's been characterized. Okay, so then we tested it on primary cells because of course it's very important. Cell lines are good, but not good enough. And what we found was that in primary cells, coumarin was more potent than in, in cell lines. And in fact, in, uh, we tested five donors with three different viruses. They're all primary isolates. <coughs> and we got very good IC50 in the range of uh, 50 to 150 nanomolar, except in one donor, donor three, uh, that required the macromolar range. We don't know why, but there could be polymorphism in some people so that uh, they, the cells don't metabolize coumarin the way it should be, or there could be some genetic problems there. So at the moment, we have investigated why, but clearly we got that data. So then we tested the uh, cytotoxicity. We know that the CC50 is eta micromolar, and also the cell growth is not particularly uh, reduced. Uh, it starts to be reduced significantly at eight micromolar. And the cell cycle profile, we checked that too. There is a trend towards um, uh, more cells in G0, uh, G1, but uh, it's, not, it's not dramatic. So there's something there. It's sort of slowing down a bit, these cells, but uh, not dramatically. All right, so what is the, uh, we need to understand, first of all, what is the step of the life cycle that is inhibited by these compounds. And one way, fairly simple, to figure it out is to do a so-called time of addition experiment. Um, in simple terms, what you do is you take your drug, uh, you infect the cells, you take the drug, and you add your drug at different time points. If the uh, particular step of the life cycle has already been completed by the time you add the compound, there will be no inhibition. But if you hit it before the, the step is completed, then there will be inhibition. So just by you know, adding the compound at different time points, you can understand something. So here, for example, we have compared this compound coumarmycin to a very potent inhibitor of the CXCR4 co-receptor. So this is entry, in fact, the very early stages. And you see that if you add the compound two hours before infection, both, both block. If you add the time zero, both block. But if you add two hours later, the virus is already in. So the uh, entry inhibitor doesn't do anything, but the coumarmycin still hits it. So we know from this experiment that it's after entry. Entry is not important for coumarmycin. So then we uh, we done this experiment again, and we compared coumarmycin with uh, a reverse scripted inhibitor, uh, AZT, and an integrase inhibitor. And you see that these compounds lose activity, the reverse scripted inhibitor lose activity um, uh, two to four hours after infection because it occurs quite quickly. Uh, the uh, integrase inhibitor loses most of the activity eight hours post-infection, so eight hours after infection integration has happened, and coumarmycin is still active. So it must be something later, after integration. 
So we tested that, and there are techniques to do that, more sophisticated than the time of addition experiment. And here they are. So here is 24 hours post-infection, and you see the infection goes down. And then you can measure the reverse transcription, how much DNA the virus has synthesized, and is unchanged. So this is, is in good agreement with the time of addition experiment. The nuclear import, you have, you have ways to measure that. Uh, it's called the two LTRs. Anyway, it's not changed. So again, that's in good agreement with the time of addition. But then we measured the integration. And in that case, we did see a reduction in integration, okay? Which was unexpected based on the time of addition. And you, we compared the activity of cumamycin to the very potent inhib inhibitor raltegravir, and it's the same profile. You see, no effect on our reverse transcription, effect on integration, there you are. So it's the same. So there is an effect of this compound on integration. But look, we did the time of addition experiment, and the effect was after integration. We do the DNA analysis, we see an effect on integration. So we were a little puzzled at the beginning, and then we decided, oh, maybe cubermycin has two effects, not just one. So can we check that? And it wasn't very easy to dissect the two effects, but one way that is possible to do it is to test the compounds in different cell types. And sometimes, if it's two different pathways, certain cells will respond to the compound and other cells will not. So that's a sort of more or less established way to check that. So that's what we did. We tested T cells, CD4 positive T cells, HeLa cells, probably most of you will know what they are, uh, 293 T cells, yes, and some other cell types. And this is a mouse cell line. So you can see here, all the cells responded to the early block that we can see in infection there, but only a few cells responded to the integration block. And these were the CD4 positive T cells. This, this, HeLa, mm, so so, not great. 293, not at all. And uh, also the others, not at all. So. From this experiment, we could confirm that curamycin was had two uh, different blocks. Okay, one was a little early, detected 24 hours, and another was at the integration step. So, so what could be the other block? Not the integration block, but the other block. So what we did was to test whether an integration, an, a step that is after integration, is gene expression. So could that be the, the block? So what we did was to transfect some plasmid DNA. Uh, that's the virus, that's a vector, HIV vector. And we transfected the plasmid DNA, and we did see a dose-dependent reduction in uh, expression, number of positive cells. And then we measured uh, gene expression in acute infection. So you infect the cells with the virus. 24 hours later, you see how many cells are infected, and you see how much uh, gene expression there is and both were down. But the interesting thing is that if you have cells that are chronically infected, so you, you infect them first, you let them go for a couple of weeks, so they are infected, and then you put the drug on after that, we didn't see any effect. So there was something happening in a rather uh, short window of time, uh, say around 24 hours post-infection, and the drug was acting at that point, and it was reducing the gene expression of the virus. All right, so just to summarize this bit, we know that cumermycin is a potent inhibitor of HIV infection. We know that cumermycin inhibits two steps. It inhibits integration. We've seen that. Same effect as raltegravir. Fine, based on the DNA experiments. But also inhibits gene expression. We've seen that based on these other experiments. So two blocks. And then we know that cumermycin A1 is uh, an inhibitor of the uh, bacterial gyrase B which is a homologue of DNA topresomerase. All right, essentially it, it uh, reduces supercalling. Now, gyrase B, it's a uh, part of the GHKL, so-called GHKL families of ATPases. From uh, gyrase B, HSP90, histidine kinase, mute L. So, GHKL. So the question is, now, what is important here to understand for us is what is the target of this drug? Is one or more targets, or what is it? We really need to know that. All right, so the crystal structure of cumermycin bound to gyrase B is known. 
And this family of ATPases is, has, although the sequence is not conserved, structurally they are quite conserved. And they all share the so-called Bergerat fold. And the Bergerat fold is essentially our uh, four beta sheets, as you can see here. And then there is a lid, uh, uh, there's some uh, alpha helices that form this lid where ATP binds. And ATP binds there, roughly. And this forms the lid, and it sits there, and is hydrolyzed. And this structure is shared among most of uh, JHKL ATPases. So what we did to find the target was, let's go back to the uh, Homo sapiens protein database and see whether there is any of this protein, of, of the human proteins that, are, that belong to, by homology, that belong to the JKHAL ATPase family. That's what we did. So these are the family members that we found in the human database. And as you would expect, we hit DNA topo 2 because there is homology. There's also functional homology with JARSB. We detected HSP90 and a number of other proteins. Now, we started excluding some of them. For example, here, you see, MORC. Uh, we excluded them because it's important. It's only expressed in uh, germ cells. It's important for spermatogenesis. So, of course, we were looking in T cells. So we sort of start, decided that was not very important. And then we have all these mutel homolog proteins, PMS, uh, MLH1, PMS family, all mismatch repair proteins, which we tended to exclude because there are a number of cell lines that lack these factors and still uh, support HIV replication, no problems. So we decided, mm, very unlikely. So the first one on which we concentrated was DNA topperizomerase 2 for the reasons that I explained to you. I said, oh yes, this is obvious, this all makes sense, you know, you have the hypothesis, is JARSB inhibitors, DNA, everything works. Well, it didn't. So, uh, this is our test that we've done. We uh, obtained some knockout cell lines for, there are two isoform alpha and beta of, of DNA topo 2. We, uh, we obtained knockout cell lines and we didn't see any difference. So this is the knockout cell, this is the normal cells, this is HIV infection, no difference whatsoever. In fact, it was even better. Uh, and even if you put on coumaromycin, no difference. We also got a human inducible uh, topo beta, a topo alpha knockout, again, no difference. And if you put on coumaromycin, no difference. We also generated our cells, some uh, topo 2 alpha knockdown cells using shRNA, no difference. And if you put a topo seed, which is a very potent topo 2 inhibitor, quite specific, again, no difference. So it's not topo 2, okay? We were very disappointed. We spent a lot of time trying to uh, prove that topo 2 was the, was the target, but it wasn't. So the next one uh, possibility was HSP90. So to figure out whether HSP90 was the target, <coughs> what we decided to do is to uh, test. There are available very potent and very selective HSP90 inhibitors. So we tested them in parallel with um, coumaromycin. And we did again a time, uh, time of addition experiment, adding the compounds at different time points and having AZT as an internal control and, and raltegravir also another internal control. As you can see here, the two compounds that inhibited uh, uh, geldanamycin and 17AG, they are related, they inhibited uh, HIV similar to coumaromycin. So even if you added at eight hours post-infection, they still inhibited HIV. So, so there was a similarity. We tested whether they could inhibit reverse subscription, and they did not, similar to coumaromycin. We tested whether they inhibited integration, and they did not. So we started to think that perhaps HSP90 was the important target for the second block, not the first block, not the block to integration, but the block to gene expression. Now, if this was the case, oh, yeah, this is just to show that they're not cytotoxic. Uh, yeah, and this is some more compounds that we tested, but I'll, I'll skip through this. Essentially, these are compounds that were uh, given to us by some biotech companies, and we confirmed that with different uh, inhibitors, we did, we did get the same uh, effect on HIV infection. So uh, HIV infection was down. <clears throat> and in this case, the IC50 is down to a few hundred nanomolars, so they're very potent. We tested uh, these inhibitors uh, in primary cells, 
And the important thing here uh, was that primary cells like gubermycin were more susceptible to LHSP19 inhibitors, particularly macrophages. They really responded very well. Uh, and, uh, and we tested whether perhaps the different, they expressed different levels of target. Because if you have less target, you need less drug to inhibit it. So uh, we tested that. And these are the T cells in which we uh, uh, done the previous experiment. And, and this is primary macrophages. You see how a few, a less HSP90 there is. This is actin. We had to overload this to see a little bit of actin, uh, a little bit of HSP90 there. And this is a primary T cell. So of course, there is less target there in primary cells, which is interesting. And also, you see a greater effect of the compound. Then we did a uh, knockdown experiment. Uh, it wasn't very easy to knock down HSP90, probably because when you try to transfect things into cells, you, uh, you stress them. Uh, so you induce HSP90. So it was a little, uh, little bit of a problem. Anyway, we tested a lot of different uh, sRNAs. Eventually, we got something that inhibited, uh, say, about twofold. Uh, and then we tested HIV infection on these knock knockdown cells, and we found that they were about twofold inhibited. HIV infection was about twofold inhibited. And if you put on the compound, you got sensitization, which means essentially that the inhibition is greater in the knockdown cells. So you have, look, you have reduced the target, therefore you need less drug. Or if you put on the same amount of drug, you have a greater effect, right? That's what, what sensitization is about. So you can do synthetic screens by that. So you knock out a number of, or knock down a number of genes, and then you test the compounds, and if you see differential effect, you know that that's probably the target. And, and here is the difference. You see the sensitization with cumarmycin is sixfold. Sensitization with another inhibitor, it's up to tenfold. So if, as I mentioned to you before, we were right that HSP90 was the important target for gene expression, we should see something that we've seen before with cumarmycin A1, which was <coughs> we transfected again the plasmid, and we used uh, a, a gel denamycin, which is, again, a, a HSP19 inhibitor. And we see the same effect, even greater, than uh, cumermycin. So re reduction in number of positive cells. And again, in acutely infected cells, reduce infection, reduce gene expression. But in chronically infected cells, no reduction on, on infection, no reduction in gene expression. So that really was phenocopying, so to speak, uh, cumermycin A1. So we were sort of encouraged in that respect that really the target could be HSP9. Now, how would that work? So one possibility is HSP90, uh, it's uh, a chaperone. Uh, a lot of uh, client proteins, including F NF-kappa-B, PEPs, other transcription factors. So one idea was, oh, maybe HSP9 is actually helping to fold this, these transcription factors and then therefore helping uh, gene expression. However, that doesn't really quite fit with the fact that if you have chronically infected cells and you put the compounds on, nothing much happens. If it was a transcription factor, it, you would see something there. So we started to suspect maybe it was, was something to do with uh, chromatin remodeling. Perhaps uh, when the virus gets in, it has to integrate, and integrates, you know, it lands in chromatin. Some of the chromatin is already predisposed for transcription, other bits, not that much. And you need, we know that we need rearrangement of a nucleosome in, in HIV to get it started. So maybe that was the case. Anyway, to test that, we did the chromatin IP. Uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with the technique. Essentially, what you do, you infect. In our case, we infected the cells. And then shortly afterwards, about 24 to 36 hours later, we fix the DNA together with the proteins and precipitate uh, with antibodies. And then we detect what uh, DNA comes down. Okay, so it's just an IP, but you use chromatin. So we tested a lot of different uh, antibodies, and we found some that were working. And here you have the fold enrichment. Now, if you use antipole 2 antibodies, you're enriched a lot uh, for the acting promoter. But if you use anti-HSP9 antibodies, you don't. So it's not that HSP9 antibodies are pulling down any gene. No, that's not the case. But if you look at these sequences here, the LTR and the GFP, now you see enrichment with the anti-HSP90 antibodies. So it means that somehow, probably indirectly, HSP90 sits here. And then when you precipitate, you enrich for this 
for these uh, um, uh, gene sequences. So maybe there is actually a link between HSP90 and gene expression. Oops. So how would kumermycin work? How would that inhibit HSP90? Right, so we've done some modeling, molecular docking studies, this with the help of our uh, uh, colleagues in medicinal chemistry. And here is HSP90, it's a dimer, and as the ATPA is at the N-terminus, so the drugs that are shown before inhibit this N-terminus pocket here, and then we found another pocket called P2, which is right at the dimerization domain. So this is the C-terminus that is coming together, and right there, there is this pocket. And we found that kumermycin could nicely sit into this pocket and perhaps block the dimerization at that point. Now, one interesting thing that we found when, when, when you do this molecular docking, to get the best fit, you, you can uh, uh, try different structures. And the best fit was with kumermycin without the pyrrolic rings. You remember the pyrrolic rings I showed you at the beginning, sticking out. Right, if you take those out, there is a much better fit. And this is not by chance, because those pyrrolic rings are generally uh, hydrolyzed inside the cells. It's something that happens normally. So that's why we wanted to test that. And, uh, and so then we did a dimerization assay. Essentially, you try how well these two C-terminus bits dimerize. We, we produced it recombinant, and we tested in the presence of kumermycin. And it actually does inhibit dimerization, but it inhibits much better. The hydrolyzed kumermycin, so without the pyrrolic rings, inhibits much better. So that makes sense, and it fits with the molecular docking stat. So we think that kumermycin does inhibit that, and inhibits HSP90, and therefore something is happening. We don't know yet what exactly, but gene expression as a consequence, HIV gene expression is reduced. What about, and I'm almost done, but what about the, the first block? What, of course, we had to understand better this one, but what about the first block on integration? So we didn't forget about that. So we tried a lot of things, and they did not work. So in the end, we said, OK, let's, let's, let's do the virus. Let's have the virus do the, the work for us. And so the way you do that, you just uh, put the compound and try to select uh, virus, viral mutants that will be resistant to the compound. And then perhaps they will teach us something. So that's what we did. And eventually, uh, playing around with the input dose and uh, little tricks, we got a virus that could escape kumermycin up to one and a half micromolar. And this is, this is the virus. And this is nevirapine as a control. And we found in this virus, we sequenced it, we sequenced several clones, and we found three mutations that were present in all clones. Of course, you're looking for mutations that are present in all clones. So this was clearly a polymorphism because it was found in many other uh, viruses. This we tested, it didn't have any effect whatsoever. And then we put this back into a virus and see, let's see what this does. And it was a mutation in capsid, so the P24. Here is the mutation, is a, a, a to S, a position 105 in capsid. And if you put it back, <coughs> it becomes, the virus becomes resistant to kumermycin. There you are. And there is a shift in the IC50 of about five folds. So it's not great, it's not a complete resistant at all, but it's clearly there and it's significant. So this mutation in capsid, what does it do? Is it, is it the gene expression block or is it integration block? So we tested that. We have a HSP9 inhibitor. We compared the normal virus and the capsid mutant virus, and the HSP9 inhibitors inhibited both viruses exactly the same. So clearly, this, this mutation in capsid doesn't care about uh, HSP9. In, uh, sorry, sorry, not doesn't care. It, it's still inhibited. So, uh, so it's not the important target. Okay? HSP9 is not the target for this virus. But when we tested integration, the mutant uh, capsid virus was, in fact, resistant to integration block mediated by kumermycin. So the mutation in capsid made somehow the virus resistant to this integration block mediated by kumermycin A1, not to the gene expression block. Uh, we can come back to this later. OK, so I told you about cyclophenin A. This binds to capsid, to this little loop here, a position centered around position 90, more or less. Here it is. And, and we think is, is somehow doing, uh, playing a role in uncoating. You know, the initial step when the, the capsid core is lost. But nobody really knows exactly how it works. 
So because kubermycin was targeting capsid, we knew that from the, from the mutant virus, and because cyclophilin also targets capsid, could there be a relationship between the two? So we tested that. We did a time of addition experiment, this time looking specifically for the integration block, not the gene expression block. And we found that both compounds had to act very early after infection. So that's consistent with an uncoating step, uh, because that must happen the first few hours post-infection. And that was the case for both uh, 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 cumermycin and cyclophilin A. You can use a drug called cyclosporin to displace uh, cyclophilin A. And cyclosporin also rescued the effect of cumermycin uh, uh, A1. So let's get that let's get that clear. If you remove cyclophilin from capsid using cyclospory A, you rescue, which means that cyclophilin A and cumermycin A1 has a have a synergistic effect. They're doing similar things, okay? And in fact, if you have a mutant virus that cannot bind cyclophilin very well, is a little more resistant to cumermycin A1. So you need cyclophilin for the optimal activity of cumermycin A1. So we think that somehow um, uh, cumermycin is acting on the uncoating step and it may, may disturb that step and as a consequence, HIV doesn't integrate very well. And we still don't understand that fully. But we'll need to do more work <coughs> on that. But that's the mechanism we think. So we've done, again, a little bit of molecular docking studies and we think that cumermycin fits very well at the end terminus. There you are. Uh, and, and, and if you look at that, the alanine 105 is right in this pocket. So it's right there. And perhaps if you change that to S, the pocket changes and cumermycin cannot bind any longer. Then we did some... Come on. Okay. We did some ITC. So this is a way to see whether uh, the drug binds to capsid. It's, it's a bio biophysical assay. Uh, and what we found was that cumermycin could indeed bind to capsid. But if you, again, if you have the hydrolyzed cumermycin lacking the pyrrolic rings, it binds much better with an IC50 or 82 micromolar compared to an, uh, uh, not IC50, uh, a binding affinity of the millimolar range. So, so we think it's binding directly to capsid. Not indirectly, it's binding directly. And it's doing something there. Uh, so, what a summary. We understood that cumermycin is a potent inhibitor of HIV infection, is a dual target, so it has two targets. One target is HSP90, one target is capsid. Uh, so this is new, all right? Because we, we didn't have any compound that actually targeted the incoming viral core and, and disturbed what we think, disturbed uncoating, and therefore disturbed integration. So this is a new concept. The HSP90 idea is also quite new. And so by using this little molecule, we discovered something interesting uh, with respect to HIV, we think. This also, uh, so there's, there's some basic implications here that we need to investigate much more. So this is just the beginning, of course. We, we just learned that. Uh, this is going to be published soon. Um, maybe HSP90 can be involved in uh, chromatin remodeling. We don't know that. Uh, in humans, but there is evidence that that's the case in Drosophila because uh, it's important for the uh, uh, tritorax gene expression patterning. If you don't have, if you have HSP90, that is completely uh, disturbed. Uh, it's also important in yeast for induction of the galactose uh, gene, genes. So we know that. Um, and then we think there is another role of capsid in integration that is probably comes from disturbed uncoating. And we need to understand more about that. There's some uh, clinical implications to that too, because uh, there are now 36 clinical trials with HSP9 inhibitors. Some are in phase three, most of them are in, are in phase two. And unfortunately, <coughs> people with HIV develop uh, Hodgkin and non Hodgkin lymphomas. And even uh, in the era of heart, there is a very high prevalence of this lymphoma in HIV positive people. Now, many of these clinical trials are, f as anti-cancer agents, many of these HSP-19 inhibitors are uh, used for, as anti-cancer agents in Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So, and the prognosis of HIV-positive patients that are suppressed 
So the viremia is suppressed during uh, chemotherapy is much better. So it's exactly the same, almost the same as people that don't have HIV. So it's clearly important to suppress HIV viremia during chemotherapy. So our idea is perhaps we could use HSP9 inhibitors and kill two pigeons with one stone. So reduce uh, uh, reactivation, reduce HIV replication, and use HSP9 inhibitors as chemotherapy, chemotherapeutic agents. So we would, li would like to investigate that. Uh, finally, one last word about, uh, and this is essentially to try to see whether there's uh, uh, possible uh, collaborations here, in the sense that we have set up, at UCL we have set up a screening facility, high throughput screening facility in the, cat, in the P3. <clears throat> so we can use it with hep C, HIV, uh, you name it. <clears throat> and we can do sRNA and small molecules. See, so if you have a nice project, uh, we'll, we will be open, we are now open, but we'll soon be open to external collaborations as well. Finally, after this detective story, I hope uh, I haven't confused you too much, uh, I would like to thank the person, uh, this is a, a work by an, another Italian colleague uh, who did a PhD with me, and most, most of this work is his PhD. Uh, Luciano, with the help of a few other people, and uh, also <coughs> Mariame Tribak and Richard Jenep uh, helped us a lot with the uh, chromatin IP studies. Uh, the medicinal chemists, David Selwood and Paul Gain, did all the molecular docking studies. <coughs> and the ITC were done by Amanda Price and Leo James. And we thank uh, these people for funding. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>